welcome back in our studio. I hope you had a nice start into the day. Thumbs up, thumbs down, how was it so far? I hope it looks good. I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> I guess it, it's all fine. So welcome to our first talk on Monday afternoon or around lunchtime. Really excited today. And the best thing first is that you can actually participate in this talk and ask questions. For that, I've brought you a picture. So let's have a look on this, because you can log into Event Moby. You already are pretty familiar with this one. And then you click on Participate in Talk. And when you participate in talk, you can ask questions directly to our host, to the guest. You can not watch the stream by clicking this button. Um, I would recommend another platform for that. For example, YouTube or livefinart.de slash opening week. But you can participate in this one. So feel free to join us here in the studio. And joining me in the studio are also our two wonderful hosts of this opening week, Hannah and Daniel. Hello, nice Hello. to have you here. How Hi. was your How was your start into this week? Uh, good, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. And for you, Daniel, as well. It's great. It's uh, sunny and the rain has stopped. All wonderful. It's yeah. the perfect weather for uh, opening week. And people right? on campus. Yes. The best thing about probably this week, people on campus. You've missed this, probably, yes, right? Incredibly. Yeah. So we already had a glimpse on the snack of the day, mm -hmm. which is this book. And maybe, Hannah, you can tell us a little bit more about Atlas of AI. Yes, Atlas of AI is, um, I think, a very telling book about, um, well, machine learning and algorithms. And, you know, um, artificial intelligence is such a buzzword at today um, that I think everyone should read about it but maybe you don't want to be a data scientist or you know you're not into you know really data science but I think it would be good for everyone to have like a common knowledge about what artificial intelligence is about and I think Kate Crawford um, she's an expert she's a scholar but she's also a researcher at Microsoft so she really has a you know, an academic but also practice perspective on artificial intelligence. And I think she provides us with a great book where you get to learn about artificial intelligence, about data, one of our hashtags of this opening week. Um, yeah, and I think it's just a really interesting book. And I think that the title, um, if you imagine a, um, an atlas in school, yeah. you probably had one. Um, when you look through an atlas, you have, you know, the world, but in, in separate perspectives, right? So mm -hmm. if you open one page, you have maybe a whole continent in front of you, and you open another picture, and then it's really a fine-grained, you know, top, uh, p um, picture of, you know, the topography of one country. And I think um, this is like a metaphor for also how Kate Crawford approaches artificial intelligence by showing us bits and pieces about artificial intelligence and sort of how artificial this technology is basically embedded in our human lives and what you know what are the consequences of using that technology and where does it come from. Um, which re resources are needed for this? So I think it's a great book. Perfect. So um, you don't, you said it. You don't need to be like deep into the topic no. in order to. No, get it's that very goes. telling also about you know how science is actually uh, created, how data science is actually created, and also embedded in the past. So how how do people learn about what are what is the data that we need, and how can we collect it in the proper way, and what are the you know pitfalls that come along when you uh, collect data. Wonderful. So a huge recommendation. Yes. Thank you for this. And are you also fine with the snack of the day? Popcorn to the... Oh, yes, please. You're fine. Only the sweet one, though. <laughs> okay. <yeah. laughs> Wonderful. So without any hesitation, I would say let's um, dive into the talk. Stage is yours. Enjoy. And tell us who's your guest today. Thank you very much. Yes, um, today's talk, um, we are very pleased um, to welcome um, Francesca Bria today. Um, she is the first keynote we will have for this opening week to, uh, in 2021. And um, when we invited her, um, I think we couldn't have chosen a better keynote speaker for, for this opening week, given that she just published three weeks ago a very telling newspaper article in the uh, Feuilleton from the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, uh, Sonntagszeitung, with the title, We Need a New Deal. And 
Daniel. Uh, and besides that, um, Francesca Pria is what I would say a, a true transdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary personality. That means she engages in the real world and, and at the same time is doing research on it. So she's an honorary professor at the University College in London, a senior consultant and ambassador of the UN Habitat Program, president of the Italian Innovation Fund. So, and I could continue all the, <laughs> the interesting and exciting steps, but um, you're probably not tuned in to hear me, but to hear what Francesca is going to tell us. Um, and therefore, I give you the floor, Francesca Bria. Welcome to, to the stage, and I hope you're doing well. How is it going? Yes, hi everyone. It is great to be uh, with you, not in person. I'm in Berlin at the moment, so doing very well. That's great. Perfect. Um, and Francesca Bria, you, you might use the first five to seven minutes to just explore a bit um, your ideas that you maybe also have um, introduced in, the, in, this, in this newspaper article, or more in general, what, what is this new deal that, that you're looking for? forward to uh, that you would require in, in these challenging times? Yes, sure. So um, let's say I would um, advance um, an hypothesis that uh, it's going to be pretty constructive and positive view of our digital future, which means uh, that uh, we have to put forward a new deal, which is a new social pact that will enable us to leverage the power of digital technologies, artificial intelligence, data and connectivity for the public interest, giving back uh, the value and the data back to society, to the people that create this value in the first place. And obviously, the fact that I'm proposing to advance a digital deal, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it's going to be a pretty complex um, uh, endeavor where I foresee Europe having to, um, to, to basically uh, really change uh, the approach to its uh, industrial policy, its regulatory approach, its economic policy, and regain digital sovereignty. Uh, let me unpack some of those uh, mm -hmm. points that I also made in the article. So first of all, I do think that the post-pandemic times is the best the moment uh, to speak about the need for a new deal because we are still in the midst of a global emergency, which is not only a health crisis and a social crisis, but also it represents uh, an unprecedented economic shock that force us to adapt as society, but also uh, to uh, think in a new way and act quickly. And during the pandemic, we all see that um, radical and future-oriented policy and actions are even more urgent now. And uh, I also think that crisis, whether wars or pandemic, uh, can sometimes feed the social imagination. Mm -hmm. And new pacts can be forged and old rules must be deeply transformed. If we look at uh, digitization, during the pandemic, we saw a forced digitization of many aspects of our daily life. And digital infrastructures have pro proved to be critical infrastructures of society on which essential services such as work, healthcare, education depend upon. So we also saw a very strong policy debate, uh, whereas access to connectivity, free, public and accessible, for example, ultra broadband, um, is to be considered a fundamental right of citizens. In some countries, we also had a conversation about making a constitutional right of citizens, ac access to the internet and access to connectivity. And on top of that, uh, developing technologies such as 5G networks, cloud computing and artificial intelligence have suddenly become national and global priorities. And I think the technology debate went far beyond um, a debate about um, you know, technological standards and gadgets and technology infrastructures only, but really reached the center stage of the policy and political debate. However, at the same time, we also realize that market dominance uh, in the digital economy is becoming a real concern. Mm 
-hmm. For big tech, uh, the pandemic was a positive shock, unlike for the entire uh, rest of the economy. While all other firms slowed down, tech firms sped up the investment and acquisitions uh, very strongly. And the major digital players have achieved a combined stock market value of over 8 trillion US dollars. With US tech shares, if we take Apple, Amazon, Facebook, um, uh, Google, uh, the US tech shares are now more valuable than the entire European stock market. And we see a, a similar trend, of course, coming uh, from the Chinese tech giants like Alibaba, Tencent, uh, Baidu or Huawei. So if five to seven companies own the digital economy, can it really work for all of us? I think here the entire society is called to ensure that the development of digital capitalism does not result in irreversible form of economic concentration. And to do that, we have to realize that we are facing a structural shift to the digital economy and what we've been calling the first industrial revolution. That's not only about the technology sector. It will affect all sectors of the economy. And we are seeing it uh, today very strongly, for example, with the crisis in the supply chain, where, for example, shortages of microchips are affecting the um, automotive uh, uh, production and where the access to raw materials such as rare earth or even the equipments that are needed uh, to make Europe um, climate neutral by 2030, which is basically in line with our climate goals, will rely on our uh, access to these uh, particular critical technologies that underpin the, the transition to, um, to digitization. Uh, furthermore, I would say that um, if we look at uh, the rise of digital capitalism, it is clear that it brings to society many challenges from monopoly power that I just mentioned to the need of a new tax for digital platforms, um, trade regulations, unemployment due to uh, automation, or even uh, the need for a new labor deal for gig workers, mm -hmm. and questions around civil liberties and democracy. And this has a lot to do with the protection of our, of our personal data and shifting from a business model that uses personal information and data as a commodity, as the new uh, money, to, towards a system that uh, recognizes that data is a common good and must be protected if we want to protect the fundamental rights of citizens. So, um, on top of that, I think we're also seeing that the public sector is increasingly dependent on the tech industry. And we rarely ask where this power and dependence come from. Mm -hmm. So why is the immense economic value that such uh, digital revolution represents are curious exclu exclusively to tech firms and not to ordinary citizens and public <coughs> institutions? This is a big question that we, we must ask. And uh, what it is that we can do um, at the moment to ensure that we return some of the value that we are creating back to the citizens while empowering citizens to participate in politics, which I think is also a very strong point because otherwise we risk uh, to detach uh, citizens from uh, public institutions and from democratic institutions of our times and we uh, risk to face things like um, populism or the rise of nationalism or even the rise of a new type of power, which is an algorithmic power that is uh, actually undermining the foundation of our liberal democracy. So just to conclude with my initial thoughts, I think that accelerating this digitization in this particular moment and in this particular post-pandemic phase is not enough. enough. It is necessary, but it's not enough. It is also necessary to give it a direction. Mm -hmm. And in my perspective, that direction is about building a new social contract for the digital society that I've been calling a smart, a green new deal because it's about using digital technologies to attain both social and environmental sustainability. Mm -hmm. And if we want to uh, basically condense this idea of the uh, new digital deal, I think it is about restoring our digital sovereignty, 
whereas digital sovereignty should uh, be understood as the right of a society to set the direction of technological progress in order to put technology and data at the service of people. <laughs> and, to, and, and people and the planet, because we want to make sure that uh, technological development will help us solving the most oppressing social and environmental issues of our times, starting with the climate emergency and the ecological transition, but also with public health care and uh, increasing polarization of wealth. Mm -hmm. So we must make sure that basically technology, uh, our technological and industrial capacity can be aligned with our uh, social economic models in a new geopolitical dimension. And if you want, we can expand all of these uh, issues uh, during our conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Francesco. This is already a, <laughs> a great overview and, and, and gives um, a, lot of, a, a lot of points where we, where we can definitely go, go into more detail. So the, the first question I, I have is that you, that you made clear in the article, but also today, that Europe plays a special role with regards to this New Deal, which is um, an interesting aspect, because then you explore that we have the big powers um, when we look to the, to the big tech companies on the one hand side in the US, where we have kind of, you know, the, the Silicon Valley superstars, everything goes, etc., And you also mentioned kind of the other side, which is um, the Chinese, the, the Chinese um, way of of using data um in a in 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 this in this uh, as a, as a superpower which role does does europe play or should europe play and maybe which role can europe play in 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 between these two um superpowers or, or strong strong momentums that we see at the moment yes so in my view um digital sovereignty means that um Digital technology should enable us to transition away from today's digital economy of surveillance capitalism, where a handful of U.S. or China-based corporations battle for digital so supremacy uh, to a people-centric digital future, which is based on better workers, environmental and citizen rights. Mm -hmm. uh, this means that we have to contest the idea that for the future of our digital society, we only have two possible routes. As you said, on one side, we have the Silicon Valley surveillance capitalism, where we rely more and more on a handful of um, big tech companies that are acquiring lots of uh, financial power, Uh, obviously, their uh, capacity to move from one sector to the other of the economy is very big also because they can, um, their, their wealth is based on intangible assets such, such as intellectual property and data. And uh, they so more and more start to control healthcare, start to control uh, transportation in our cities, start to control, you know, our technological infrastructures in many sectors of society. So it may look uh, convenient in the first moment, but then we understand how much dependency mm -hmm. we are going to have towards this kind of data oligopoly. On the other side, we don't have the big tech, but we have the big state, mm -hmm. the kind of Chinese Orwellian system that also is, can be pretty effective uh, because you know, they can solve centrally in a, in a, in a central way Uh, many uh, pressing social and economic issues, but it's not definitely not compatible with our idea of individual freedom and fundamental rights. Uh, and also, I think we strongly reject an idea where data um, can be used, for example, for uh, this kind of credit, social credit system Uh, where the data of citizens is continuously uh, mined and aggregated uh, in order to create a um, social ranking system that exclude or can exclude and have, can have strong discrimination uh, for uh, a large majority of the population. So I think we have to put forward a third way, which I've been calling big democracy, beyond the big tech and the mm -hmm. big state, and that's big democracy. And I think that Europe is the only uh, power that is now position, well positioned to put forward this other idea of our digital future that's based on, as I said before, uh, protecting our uh, sovereignty, our information self-determination, 
our collective rights, worker rights, and in particular, mobilizing this capacity, this technological capacity for the big challenges such as the climate emergency, mm -hmm. which I think it's, it's a topic that we, we all the time have to stress how it is important that we align the digital transition with the uh, ecological transition and uh, you know we we do something radical now to uh, stop the climate emergency mm -hmm. so obviously this is not just um, affirming that we have different principles and values and that these values are actually in the case of Europe um, inscribed in our constitutional framework uh, but also uh, it is it is a question of um, for Europe um, to move beyond being perceived only as the big uh, regulatory power of the digital age, but also being able to compete on scientific innovation and technological innovation, mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise we can we can't we, we regulate, but we don't have the power to enforce our regulation because we depend on the Chinese and uh, U.S. tech giants, and this is now in this geopolitical um, situation uh, very. Um, well, it is very troubling for Europe to be dependent so much on the on mm -hmm. the on basically on who is going to set the rules of the of the world on the U.S. or China. Mm -hmm. So this is a matter. This is obviously in this in this vision, um, technological sovereignty is a matter of political. I mean, geopolitical and economic sovereignty as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the very interesting. And, and in your article, you even emphasize a, a different regulatory level or a different, a different geographic level that is, that is highly important, that is the city. Uh, you make a very strong point that, that, that cities, forerunner cities, might be the, the places where, where this transformation starts, where we can really foster this, this idea of a, of a digital sovereignty. Maybe you can explore a bit why cities you know, it's yeah. it, it's not the, the the big players making the policies are <clears throat> on a national level or on an international level or in companies, and you emphasize the city level. Maybe you can explore a bit why are cities so important. Yes. So I don't want to be um, naive about the the role and the limitation of cities. Uh, so I think that uh, empowering cities in this um, digital transition today means basically shifting back the power to the citizens. And cities mm -hmm. have a very important role because of their proximity uh, to the citizens and because of um, their capacity to be closer to communities, to include people in the democratic democratic process which i think is a very important uh, uh, very important part of the of the transformation that we have to make um, and also cities uh, have been at the frontier of many of these uh, big, uh, you know, issues from uh, fighting climate change to migration to solidarity based networks. Uh, cities, um, because of their ability also to implement uh, from the ground up specific policies, I think are at the frontier of experimentation and experimenting mm -hmm. new policy ideas and also new technological infrastructures and tools that can be scaled uh, at national level and the European level. Uh, cities also, in particular in Europe, uh, are managing uh, urban infrastructures and managing mm -hmm. critical urban services for citizens, um, from mobility uh, to um, you know, to housing, uh, to uh, energy, uh, to water management, many of these urban infrastructures and many of those policies are in the hands of cities. And uh, we need to basically understand that when we're talking about connectivity and data today, uh, we're talking about a meta utility, like a new type of public infrastructure uh, that is needed in order to deliver public services to citizens, affordable housing, uh, the energy transition, a better electric and connected mobility, and to really improve the life of citizens in the city. And I think this makes also the role of data and the role of technological infrastructures more concrete and closer to people's needs. Mm -hmm. So people need to understand that, you know, if they... Um, we had it, for example, uh, in Barcelona very clearly with the, with the crisis around Airbnb and the new mm -hmm. platform economy. 
uh, citizens weren't really uh, worried about uh, their privacy. I mean, not only, you know, about their privacy and, you know, algorithmic regulation or algorithmic discrimination. They were worried about the increase of their rent. Mm -hmm. And they were worried about the fact that they could not live anymore in the city centers and they were evicted because of the business of the impact coming of the business model of technology platforms such as Airbnb, for example. And um, the city, uh, when it was regulating uh, the, uh, the, the housing market in order to uh, pursue their affordable housing policy, understood that if they weren't uh, controlling this new uh, platform economy, they were not able anymore to regulate the housing market. And so they started to demand Airbnb access to data and access to, uh, to data as a mean to uh, regulate the housing market. Because uh, if you don't understand how, for example, their algorithm is having an impact of the, on the price of housing, um, you cannot regulate it anymore. And so this becomes clear that uh, basically the focus should not be on the technology itself. And also, I think as technology experts, we struggle to understand that it also should not be only about privacy and about data and information self-determination. These are all very important things, but that sometimes only experts understand. But if you, if you tell citizens that this has an impact on their affordable housing policy and on the price of their rent and on where they're capable to live or on their public transportation system, on their capacity to, uh, to have, um, you know, a, a better, yeah, a better uh, transportation system, a better mobility in their city or to, to have less pollution because, you know, we can uh, monitor the um, the, the, the increase the CO2 emissions in the area and we can fight climate change, so decrease pollution and so on, then they mobilize. They understand the importance of this kind of topic. So we need to reconcile the technology discourse with what really matters to people. <laughs> and I think cities are a great place to do that if we engage in a democratic process. So another very important part uh, for my work in cities has been the need to reclaim democracy back and to shift back the power to people when it comes to make decisions that will shape the future of their city. Mm -hmm. So we need to basically revitalize democracy. And uh, for example, in Barcelona, we have done that by using a hybrid method of participatory democracy that was online and offline, using also a platform which I can, I can, I want to, talk about a little bit because I think it can be an example of this bottom-up, open source, privacy enhancing and rights preserving technology built by a community in, in a city and then scaled up at a European and global level. Mm -hmm. So Decidim.org, which is the participatory democracy platform of the city of Barcelona, uh, it was actually initially conceived as a research program funded by um, research and innovation money from the European Commission. And then uh, it started to become the participatory platform of the city of Barcelona. And it is now being used by the conference, uh, by the European Commission, the European Parliament and the Council of Europe for the conference on the future of Europe. So, you know, thousands, um, hundreds of thousands of citizens and, at the moment across Europe are using this open source platform, which is privacy preserving, where the data uh, belongs to the citizen. The platform belongs to the citizens, actually, so it's not owned by any private company. And the rules of the game are different from commercial social media platforms that use our data for mm -hmm. advertising purposes or manipulate our data or uh, sell our data in a secondary market. So this is a very important difference. So mm -hmm. these platforms are built for democratic participation. And so the rules, uh, how they are governed and how they work, they have that purpose in mind, mm -hmm. which is the public interest. And that's what makes, for example, participatory democracy, which is born uh, in a city, uh, in, a digital, in a digital way, um, it's possible to scale those infrastructures and tools at a pan-European level. So um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to demonstrate that because, you know, sometimes um, the discourse is yes, but we do not have enough investment. We do not have enough capital. We will never be able 
to have any of those kind of applications made in Europe or made in Europe even, uh, you know, in this kind of uh, democratic governance fashion that I'm advocating for. But it is possible. And we have done that in Barcelona. And also in Barcelona, we have done a variety of experiments regarding data. I don't know if you want to talk about that later. I should mention it now. But we basically have experimented with an idea of data sovereignty mm -hmm. uh, that means that, um, you know, data, uh, well, data creates a lot of public value because, as I said before, with data, uh, we can tackle lots of city problems, we can take better decisions, we can make new uh, artificial intelligence driven services. So the data that we uh, produce and collect all the time have a lot of value. Mm -hmm. But instead of having this data ending up in the data centers of a few uh, tech companies, uh, we can also um, make sure that citizens can be much more in control of how their data is used. Mm -hmm. So they can uh, decide what data they want to keep private and use strong cryptography to do that. So we have to make cryptography easy for the people. Then they can decide what data they want to share, with whom they want to share the data, and on what terms. So this kind of data sharing and data exchange becomes much more uh, transparent based on um, democratic agreements where the control is with the citizen. Mm -hmm. And we can use decentralized infrastructure with um, you know, advanced cryptography, such as distributed ledger technology and advanced cryptography protocols to do that. Of course, within the framework of the GDPR, the data protection regulation, and the rights to data, which should be enforced in our regulatory framework, which now Europe is going uh, to do with the uh, Data Governance Act. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have been prototyping this kind of uh, data democracy, uh, which is um, which is very important because also there we have resisted the idea that you can have the data either with a big tech or with a big state, mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, people wouldn't trust, I mean, they don't trust Google with their data, but they also don't trust the government with their data. And so um, there can be part of the digital infrastructure that can be public infrastructures, in fact, funded by public money and managed by the state, but they should be part of the infrastructures that are decentralized mm -hmm. and where citizens themselves can have the control in particular, over how their data is used and how their data is accessed. Mm -hmm. And this is what we've done at city level with the Decode project, which now has been, you know, uh, becoming a kind of a standard for many experimentations around data democracy and data sovereignty that are happening in cities. Uh, super interesting. And then, you, you know, I, I look at my questions and you're answering them while while talking. That's excellent. <laughs> that, that, that's fantastic. Um, you know, we, we have here in the in the starting week, we have kind of different hashtags. We have the hashtag um, digital, we have the hashtag democratic, and I think you already explored on those. We have the, the hashtag um, equal equality that you also touched upon, but we also have the hashtag green. And you mentioned already, and on the European level, there is now the you know many even increasingly it's talked about this twin transformation the digital and green transformation you also label as you said already um the the new deal as a smart green new deal could you explore a bit more on this idea why why and how exactly this did these two transformations can be interconnected in a positive way and and um, you mentioned earlier already that that the digital can be a means and a leverage to really yeah. tackle these fundamental challenges we have such as biodiversity loss climate change um, depletion of resources etc cetera, etc cetera. maybe you can, can can give us some some sense and uh, some examples how how the the, the the digital transformation can really contribute to managing and coping with these fundamental challenges we are facing Yeah, so I, I think this also connects to the broader conversation about um, digital sovereignty and the need for a new industrial policy uh, for Europe, because I don't want to 
escape that level of conversation because obviously I'm very uh, excited about the possibility to build a network of cities that are, I mean, their, their, their main strength is democratic participation of citizens and they really start experimenting from the bottom up, mm -hmm. you know, changing things in communities, scaling them up, but also tackling problems such as, uh, for example, I mentioned before how it is important if you want to uh, tackle um, climate change, uh, for example, to measure CO2 to pollution. I mean, to do that, you know, you need, I mean, now we have been doing a lot of experiments about, um, uh, you know, how to measure that in the built environment, how to measure that in the air, what kind of sensor do you need, how you need to integrate the data uh, before you take policy decision, but also after to measure that what you're doing is actually having an impact. Um, it is the same <coughs> for uh, connected and uh, mobility. If you want to transition to electric mobility and connected mobility, it's all going to be about, um, you know, well, the, the shift to 5G, but also uh, then, you know, having uh, the, the possibility to produce data and then having machine learning and algorithms that uh, help you to, um, to basically... Um, move towards connected mobility. Uh, so you need this data and the data that will be produced is going to be much more than what we are using today in the urban environment. Uh, but also broadly, I mean, if we move away from cities, uh, we can see how it is important that the European industrial policy uh, that um, now after the pandemic, uh, finally, it's becoming a, ven a very central part of the economic policy of Europe, tackles the digital transition. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, you know, investing in uh, 5G, in uh, uh, cloud computing, in uh, quantum, in artificial intelligence, in how to manage data differently. Uh, in uh, microchips, because this is part of the of the um, new um, European industrial strategy. So we have a, a new Europe um, microchip act mm -hmm. that uh, set the standards to produce uh, uh, and design and produce microchip. Twenty percent of the microchips we need in Europe at the moment we do less than ten percent. So it's a big change and a big uh, industrial capacity that we have to build. But the question is, for what we are building all this industrial capacity, all this digital capacity? And obviously, the first answer should be to decarbonize the economy, mm -hmm. to shift to, to, for the ecological transition, uh, which on one side is about producing renewable energy and being able to... Um, yeah, to help our companies to move towards a more circular economy, so decarbonize how they, um, you know, even the, the logistics and the, and the way they produce. Uh, but then our capacity to be able to produce electric batteries, uh, to be able to um, shift to... Um, to a more ecological mode of production will also depend on our technological capacity. So the two things are very mm -hmm. strongly linked and strongly integrated, and we can't do one without the other. And uh, so, so we need to bring those um, these two, let's say, strand of our industrial policy. I mean, now. Uh, Europe is investing, I think, in the post-recovery uh, plan around more than two trillion uh, euros. I think this is uh, something uh, historical for Europe because we are mutualizing the debt and we are investing in the national recovery plan of each member states with one common direction. And 40% of uh, that um, amount is going to the ecological transition and more than 20% to the digital transition. Mm -hmm. This means that we will have around 400 billion uh, euros, for example, to invest in the critical infrastructure, critical technological infrastructures of the future. So this, uh, well, in this respect, I think we have a lot of questions because obviously we know that Europe is not uh, uh, independent, is not autonomous at the moment. Technologically, we rely on on uh, basically everything when it comes to software, to cloud, to data, to hardware, on external producers. Mm, we said it before, the big tech, the US and uh, Chinese mainly. And uh, microchips, for example, are produced in Taiwan for 80%. Uh, so we are not um, autonomous. We are mm -hmm. not, we are not uh, in technologically independent. 
And so we have to regain some of that independence. We also need uh, technological champions here in Europe, I think. We oh, Francesca, we, we... Yeah. Okay, now we can hear you yeah. again. Perfect. Ah, okay. so, but, but, but it was only a moon. Thanks a lot, Francesca. That, that, I, I think we got, we, we got the basic idea. And before we continue asking questions also to the students again, please feel free to, to zoom in and, and, also, and also ask questions. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, maybe I can just jump in because you, you talked a lot about um, Europe. Um, obviously, here at Leuphana University, um, we, we, uh, we are also interested in you know, the German context giving that we just had a, um, a large national election and probably since you're in Berlin uh, and you're also involved in, in, in a project called the New Hanse which hopes to use the digital transformation to make um, the city of Hamburg which is actually quite close here to Lüneburg um, mm -hmm. a greener more social city. Um, comparing your um, experiences from the city of Barcelona and, um, um, and citizen participation there, what are your expectations and also maybe also your experiences so far in Germany with regards to German cities uh, cities being sort of the leverage um, for the digital transformation in, Germ in Germany as well? Yeah, I, I, I really hope to see a, a bigger movement coming from the German cities because I think uh, this kind of approach to, to sustainable and democratic digitization in Europe needs to start from cities, needs to start where people live, where people are, because it's very important, um, as I'm saying, to integrate the digital into you know, the rest of the economy of society, into the kind of social, economic and democratic movement models that we want. Otherwise, we risk to have a complete decoupling of the digital and industrial capacity on one side, but then society uh, we, we, where many people are left behind, where people do not trust the technology they use, but also they do not trust politicians and public institutions. And then we have, uh, you know, we risk to break society. So I think we need to start where people are. We need to start where uh, citizens are. And in Germany in particular, and that's why I like a lot to work in the city of Hamburg, uh, I think uh, German people are very aware about their rights when it comes to technology, mm. obviously because of their past, their rights, um, for example, information self-determination and privacy. They really care about how you know, data is kept, how data is used, which is very positive. So I think we have to show that there is no contradiction, for example, between the right to privacy and uh, protecting people's fundamental rights in the digital society and our capacity to leverage the power of digital connectivity, data, artificial intelligence for the public interest or even to create better services and, and to advance as leaders in the technological uh, revolution. I think this is very important for me because we are seeing now, for example, during the pandemic, a lot of, um, you know, contrast between, okay, <laughs> can we roll out a green pass or can we roll out an app that's tracking how we're doing with fighting the pandemic without, you know, compromising our right to privacy and our democratic control mm -hmm. of data and digital infrastructure. I think we can, if we uh, um, empower, I mean, if we invest in privacy enhancing technologies, for example, if technology experts, cryptographers, uh, security experts, ethical experts work very closely with politicians and policymakers and with the data protection regulators and so on, we can, in fact, develop technologies that are able to enable us, um, you know, this kind of interaction uh, in a different way, in a more aware way. I think this is possible. Uh, then coming to the nuance, I think uh, with the nuance, we want to bring uh, very centrally to the core of Europe, uh, this idea that we need to combine citizen democratic participation, large scale citizen democratic participation to integrate the collective intelligence of citizens into the way we take policy decision with data democracy and the new deal on data which we call data commons so using data as a public infrastructure as a public good to tackle net zero so we will focus on all the climate uh, plan and all the targets that the city has to 
to decarbonize, uh, to you know, to fight uh, CO2 emissions, to to reduce uh, emissions um, due to mobility, to the use of cars in cities, um, in, in particular the mobility part. And uh, and uh, and basically, we will um, we will work with the ecosystem of the city in order to show that there is a. I mean, there is an agenda there that's very, very interesting for the future. And I think the city of Hamburg has a very strong tradition when it comes to citizen participation in urban planning. Uh, they also have a very strong tradition of transparency. They had a very uh, important transparency law. They have a very uh, solid data infrastructure and they are pioneering new uh, kind of data driven programs. So I think it fits very well with turning Hamburg in a kind of European hub for this kind of experimentation. But at the same time, we're also interested to create a, a European movement of cities that in fact are, be, are bringing forward this agenda because my, um, well, otherwise, you know, I think uh, cities will become only clients of the technology giants and they won't be creating internal capabilities and capacity to drive and to govern this technological transformation for their citizens. Because they will be just, uh, you know, basically a client of these big tech companies that they're going to sell them solutions, which uh, all the time actually never tackle the real problems, but they create new problems, which are technology problems that the city is going to have to solve. And the problem is there is also uh, outsourcing, externalizing all your, um, you know, data, for example, uh, or um, IP assets when you're dealing with tech companies. So we are working a lot, for example, with cities on procurement, on mm -hmm. how to build internal capacity, how to train people, how to make sure that also the public sector is seen as a place where we can innovate and we can create a new space <laughs> for for innovation. Yeah, I know it's uh, it's. Yeah, uh, it's I not think that's probably the largest challenge that I can see so far as as German bureaucracies and institutions yeah. uh, like public institutions are not the place where people would imagine innovation takes place. Right? I think yeah, that's. But you know, if you if you if you don't. Uh, start from places like cities that cities can do they're more agile they can do a lot of things they have money and capacity and in germany in particular because of your federal structure mm -hmm. and 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 you know you can iterate you can involve also smaller companies startups um, innovators cities can do a lot of those things in a more agile way mm -hmm. and germany which now is going to invest so much money in the kind of recovery phase in digitization can show that there is a way to digitalize that is sustainable and democratic and can really bring people in. <laughs> and I think uh, if we don't start from cities, it's going to be very hard uh, to do it from the central administration. Yeah. I think so it's, we need it's, it's synergies. Smart. Yeah, I think yeah. it's it's brilliant to think of, of 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 cities as basically being in between levels between you know citizens on the ground basically and higher institutions that seem to be so far away from the daily life of, uh, of uh, citizens and their concerns, right? So I think it's a brilliant uh, thought to to include cities as infrastructures and also as basically um, the institution that basically discusses and negotiates and translates between citizen concerns and needs towards higher institutions and the state level and potentially even um, global levels. Um, so my, my question would be also with regards to education. So you said um, um, citizens have to, uh, should uh, you know, have to participate, should be involved in these processes. But I imagine that also that links to the question of how do we educate ourselves with regards to what happens to our data? Because as you mm -hmm. said, you know, a lot of people are hesitant or are aware that their data can be used for, I don't know, manipulating them or controlling them. But then obviously, you know, all of us use the, you know, the, the products and services that don't respect our privacy at all from the big tech companies, right? So mm -hmm. implicitly, there is like a paradox. On the one hand, we we are aware of these challenges and at the same time we, we rely on these technologies. So what, are, what is in terms mm. of data, data literacy or digital literacy in your regards, what is the, where do, should we start educating people and what are the skills that we need, um, so to speak, to make this transformation also stuck, stick with the citizens and make them be, become part of it? Yeah. 
Uh, well, first of all, I think we have to be aware uh, that the reason why we're stuck with those technology has nothing to do with technology itself, but with the business model. Mm -hmm. So uh, many times when we look at uh, the problem in digital platforms is not really how the technology is conceived. I mean, many of those companies, even if you take Google or Facebook or Apple, they have the best security experts in the world. Of course, this is one of the problems that we have to be able to retain talent also here in Europe and not, <laughs> uh, you know, just um, train them in university like yours and in many other brilliant university and research centers across Europe, but then, you know, they have to go to Silicon Valley if they want to work in technology or in digital. Um, but and, and they are perfectly able to build um, uh, privacy enhancing technologies and technologies that preserve and respect uh, people's fundamental rights. But they don't do that because of the business model, because mm -hmm. the business model is based on the manipulation and the monetization of personal information and data. So this is the problem, what Shoshana Zuboff um, calls surveillance capitalism. And we need to shift away from that. And we need to shift away from that that model uh, towards the model that, um, you know, rewards the fact that we use uh, technologies that protect our rights, that make us think, that make us aware, and that enable solidarity-based kind of networks. And not, for example, algorithms that polarize things or that create, um, you know, more fake news or hate speech or conspiracy theories because they spread fast and then we can have more advertising money and we can have more revenues for the um, platform owners. So, I mean, these are all problems that are not derived from the technology itself, but from the business model. And my, my answer also tells you that basically... Uh, when we talk about digital skills, it's not that, that they are not only digital, it's not only computer science, it's not only technology, it has to involve also economic thinking, social science, um, you know, philosophy, uh, history, <laughs> um, geopolitics, um, I sustainability mean, many different science. sustainability <laughs> and climate. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, so basically, we really need uh, a truly uh, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary approach if we want to understand all the implication of technology and how to deal with that as a society. And lots of critical thinking as well, which is nothing to do like, you know, um, teach how to code. Uh, you know that, that that's a part, but we and 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 and, and train in kind of tech, technology training. But I think it's as as important to have critical thinking and to have exactly sustainability, ecology, economics, social science, uh, and so on. So I think it has to be a, a kind of broader approach. And by saying that, I mentioned that I'm also now advising Ursula von der Leyen in this very ambitious and very interesting project that is the new European Bauhaus. And I've been working for the European Commission for many years. And I have to say this project for me is very special because it's the first time that Europe is kind of setting a, a growth strategy, setting a policy agenda with the Green Deal uh, which is very, of course, kind of uh, regulatory, which has lots of implication when it comes to uh, sustainability, to laws, to uh, financial mechanisms, to investment schemes and so on. But also is putting forward a kind of call to a cultural and artistic movement to help us deliver in the Green Deal. So the president really understands that if we want to make the Green Deal a reality, so turn it into concrete um, innovations and projects that are going to have an impact on people's life that change, you know, uh, the way we eat, the way we produce, the way we, we work in cities, um, bring forests back to the cities, decarbonize the built environment because we need to do that badly, rethink urban planning, also involve the countryside because it's not only about cities and involve communities, involve a variety of different industries. We need uh, also the, the artists. We we need the we need to change we, we need the i mean science and technology experts with experts coming from other uh, uh, environments for example human um, human sciences and we need to mobilize a cultural movement to do that 
Um, and I think this is this is so architects, urban planners, artists uh, together with technologists and you know climate experts and uh, scientists. And so I think this is uh, maybe uh, one of the yeah a project that um, answers a little bit to your question because that's what the the Bauhaus did I think in the 1930s is also reinventing a type of education, reinventing you know uh, giving bringing together the science of ecology and design to uh, give rise to modern architecture by reinventing the educational st- the, the education. And that's something we need to do right now if we want to deliver the ecological transition and the digital transition with, uh, you know, people first. People first. I think that's a that's a great motto for 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 our opening week's um, idea of a new deal. So that putting people's um, needs first uh, means also considering technology as a means to serve a, a, a greater good, so to speak. Right. And and I think um, that's a fantastic vision. Um, maybe one final question from my side. Um, so Francesca, if what are the thinkers, the writers? the philosophers that you look up to if you would have to make a recommendation for our students for the upcoming semester to think about or to write something um, who should they write uh, or uh, read about who should they you know investigate whose ideas influence you obviously your own work is um, highly inspirational <laughs> but I'm I'm sure you're building up on you know on the uh, standing on the st- on the on the shoulders of other giants so to speak what are your recommendations in terms of what should our students uh, read about potentially? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to uh, now you know, give a curricula like that, <laughs> but definitely, uh, well, no, well, I actually think there is uh, sometimes we um, don't look, um, when, when, we, when we study technology and we look at technological development, we don't look at the past enough. So I would advise you to look at historians of technology. As you know, I'm married with one of them, like <laughs> Danny Morozov. And uh, obviously his work, I think, is very important to understand the kind of history historical and geopolitical implication of technology and he has been also building on the shoulders of giants for example now we've been uh, discussing together and investigating uh, the project cyber scene you know in uh, in chile in the 1970s um, from uh, from allende and where you know how they brought together cyberneticians with uh, economists with planners to to uh, use technology to rethink a socialist economy uh, in chile before the coup d'etat and that's uh, for example a great a great thing they, they could they could read uh, uh, Medina's book on cyber scene uh, that is I think uh, a great book and then I, I mentioned Shoshana Zuboff um, also that book is pretty <laughs> thick and uh, you need more than one semester that. to read that <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, when it comes to actually uh, the new type of economic thinking we need I work with Mariana Mazzucato so mm-hmm. they can also read uh, her work about the entrepreneurial state and how it is important to have a kind of industrial policy and a kind of, um, you know, state uh, that invests in the future and that uh, can plan an economy differently without, uh, you know, just uh, with, with public return and creating public value. So those are some of the things they can definitely read. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think that was very insightful. So thanks also from my side, Francesca. I think that was a, a, a wonderful and very inspirational talk we had today. We could continue for the, for, the, for the next hours, I think, exploring your ideas. But I think this is really a lot of um, food of thought for also for our students now in the project work that you will continue. Um, we look very much forward um, to the insights of the students. Um, Do your work, take the different insights. um, And for the students, uh, we would recommend tonight we have another Future of the City um, magazine of the city of Lüneburg. Then it's in German, where people involved in this project, the Future of the City in Lüneburg, really will report what happened over the last couple of months, um, how they experienced the corona crisis. There will also be one person who really will tell you how you can engage on a city level 
with this future of city in Lüneburg, do some experimentations also with, with data. So I think that's a, a great transition on the one hand side now into your project work. You got a lot of inspiration today by Francesca Bria. And then also into the evening, we have talked a lot about cities. Tonight, it will be really one hour talking about the city that you will live in for the next, for the next three years. So I think that's a, that's a great way forward. There will be a great afternoon, a great rest of the week. From my side, again, Francesca, thanks a lot for joining us. And it was not only on paper that we thought that this is the ideal <laughs> start and the perfect <laughs> starting dialogue of this, of this starting week. But I think it was exactly what we imagined it to be, bringing the different hashtags together, departing from data. So thanks again, and we look forward thank to the new Hanseatic. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to Bye, Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.